Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk with you about Harriet Tubman, one of the great American heroes. She's a marvelous model of courage and caring, as well as determination and savvy. She's an activist for justice who was guided by strong religious faith and visionary experience. And she was also a smart woman with a great sense of humor. So her story has something in it for everyone. And of course, she's been made freshly famous as the woman who will displace Andrew Jackson, thank heavens, not Alexander Hamilton, on the front of the $20 bill of the future. So I hope you will agree that we all need to keep up to date on her achievements. She has had instant name recognition, or she has had and still does have instant name recognition today through the US and abroad, but her fame has been neither automatic nor historically continuous. Her associates in the anti-slavery movement in the last years of the Civil War widely promoted her as a heroine of the day, a remarkable, successful fugitive from slavery who dared to return south on multiple missions to rescue others. In drawing rooms and churches and on the public anti-slavery platform, she told thrilling, sometimes comic, and often inspiring real-life adventure stories. Then, during the Civil War, there was news in abolitionist papers about her assisting the Union, Union Army as a spy, and even helping to initiate and lead a successful gunboat raid by African-American troops that helped liberate hundreds of the enslaved from a Confederate plantation on the Combahee River. But after the war, living quietly on the economic margins in Auburn, New York, she vanished into obscurity. In the 1880s, through her continuing association with white progressive neighbors and allies, she connected with the branch of the women's suffrage movement that had abolitionist roots. At the organizing convention of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, honored as Mother Tubman, she spoke about her urgent late life project to create a rest home for the aged, and again told familiar stories about the thrilling exploits of her younger years. After her death in 1913, she continued to be held up as a heroine by some in the African American community. Amongst most whites, however, she was completely unknown for at least another 30 years. During the Depression, strong critiques of the American social and economic order led to a renaissance in Tubman's mainstream fame. The left-wing white journalist and social reformer Earl Conrad used fresh research to draw an inspiring portrait of an anti-racist militancy in Tubman in his 1943 biography, which was incidentally refused by several white publishers, but finally published by the African-American historian Carter G. Woodson. In the 1950s and 1960s, as civil rights activism raised national awareness of the damaging effects of legal segregation and racial terrorism, the Tubman story was carried widely into children's and young people's books, sometimes in novelized forms. In the 70s, she appealed tremendously to feminists seeking strong women in history, as well as to black cultural nationalists and activists in the multicultural education movement. Throughout this roller coaster history of her fame, she was always used by admirers as a potent symbol, read in multiple ways, and a weapon in the struggles in the, of the era over race and gender. Is it possible to get behind the highly colored, politically tendentious pictures of a completely altruistic and militant heroine that we are so familiar with from the children's books and the high school term papers? How can we approach her as a complex person living within her own time and place? And most crucially, what can we learn about how she understood herself? One key to her motivation and choices and to the sources of her activism in her day is her spiritual life. I myself came to write a book about Tubman through strong prior interest in how spirituality functioned as a resource in the 19th century for women without access to other kinds of power. As I had accidentally discovered in prior research on women's cultural history, 
There were a surprising number of published spiritual autobiographies by African American women preachers from this period that described how spiritual transformation experiences had led them to their calling despite strong opposition from their churches and families. These women used their spiritual talents and especially the ability to access divine guidance through dreaming and waking visionary experience to conquer the self-doubt and social approval, disapproval, I'm sorry, that might otherwise have prevented them from taking up public roles as female religious leaders. So it was with these spiritual autobiographies in mind that I first approached Harriet Tubman's story. Unlike the preachers I had studied, however, Tubman was not literate. Therefore, she was dependent on others throughout her life to put her story before the public. This fact obviously presented special problems for anyone interested in exploring her thoughts and feelings, including her spiritual experiences. The most extensive narrative of Tubman's life to appear during her lifetime was a book written by Sarah Bradford based on interviews with Tubman not long after the Civil War. Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman was published in 1869 and then expanded, revised, and republished in 1886 under the new title, Harriet the Moses of Her People. This mediated life story, as represented in these two books, while not the self-authored spiritual transformation story I was looking for, does help illuminate the inner sources of Tubman's life as an anti-slavery activist. Today, I will try to give you a sense of the challenges and potential rewards that I encountered in trying to discern Tubman's own perspectives on her spirituality from within this collaborative text. Tubman's collaborator, Sarah Bradford, was a genteel white teacher and writer of children's stories who had already met Tubman's parents in the Sunday school class she taught at the local church. Tubman herself was having great difficulty at this point supporting her aging parents who were living in a mortgaged house. So Bradford was recruited by abolitionist friends to write a life history book of Tubman for sale as a fundraising project. Bradford interviewed Tubman and received a few documents and testimonial letters from Tubman's former associates. The small, disorganized book that emerged for publication was written in great haste before a planned European trip, as Bradford herself acknowledged. Twenty years later, again at Tubman's request and because of financial need again, Bradford produced the enlarged and retitled Harriet the Moses of Her People. The later version, in particular, became one of the main sources that shaped later biographies of Tubman and all those encyclopedia entries at least until the Conrad biography in the mid-20th century. Both of Bradford's books contain many significant errors of fact that have made their way into almost all the encyclopedia entries and the children's books. They are also full of heavy plantation dialect and jarring racial stereotyping characteristic of the post-Reconstruction period. But for all the difficulties we encounter in reading these books today, we simply cannot do without them if we are interested in Tubman's spiritual life. The interview material retrieved by Bradford includes some of the fullest and earliest recorded versions of Tubman's key stories about her life, and so it's of great historic value. And while it is true that Bradford, as the writer and editor, controlled the final form of the narrative, it is important to stress Tubman's own assertive role in creating meaning as the one who chose which stories to tell and how to tell them. Before turning to one key story for a closer look, then, I'd like to spend just a few moments paying attention to the likely power dynamics of the interview situation between Tubman and Bradford. As a self-liberated refugee from southern slavery, Tubman was very cautious and canny she was skilled in wearing the mask in interactions with those whites who were or might be supporters of slavery. However, at the time of the interviews with Bradford, she had, tw she had had 20 years of experience 
working with committed anti-slavery activists, many of them white, several of them women. During the Underground Railroad years, some of her anti-slavery associates in the North had helped her raise money to pay for her trip south, and some had been supporters of the John Brown uprising conspiracy. During the war years, influential white friends in Massachusetts and New York abolitionist circles had recommended her for spy work with the Union Army. Others had brought parts of her story into the public realm. So Tubman would have had strong reasons to trust Sarah Bradford to convey her story, given that Bradford had been recruited by some of these tested political associates. Tubman would also have had a double agenda of her own in participating in the project. There was the pressing practical need to support her family above all, but there must also have been a strong desire to communicate broadly her experiences, both of the evils of slavery and of God's providential support for slavery's foes. Though she had not been able to follow through on her recorded wish to acquire literacy in order to tell her own life story, she had developed considerable skills as a public storyteller in both private and public settings. Clearly, the racial and class etiquette as observed by in northern abolitionist circles of the day would have shaped her self-expression to some extent in these interviews with Bradford. But lest we should think of Tubman as easily intimidated by an interview situation like the one with Bradford, we can turn to testimony by another of her white anti-slavery uh, friends, Edna Cheney, who reported in 1865 that once Tubman got started telling an important story, it was useless for her listener to try to interrupt her flow. And I quote, she loves to describe her visions, which are very real to her, but she must tell them word for word as they lie in her untutored mind with endless repetitions and details. She cannot shorten or condense them, whatever be your haste. She has great dramatic power. The scene rises before you as she saw it, and her voice and language change with different actors. In my view, then, Tubman should be understood as a fully co-authoring partner in the collaboration on this book. She used Bradford, <clears throat> the flawed medium at hand, to convey to the public the sense of connection she experienced between what we would call her social justice activism and her spiritual life. With the aid of other early documents from interviewers and observers, it is possible to make good use of what Bradford gleaned, while also undoing some of the likely distorting effects of Bradford's writing style and editorial choices. In the time I have left today, I will focus on one key story about Bradman's spirituality as an example of this process. Tubman's religiosity was nominally Christian, but it was not the product of church doctrine or training. And in many ways, it would have seemed quite foreign to someone like Bradford, a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher whose brother was a church historian in a theological seminary. Tubman had likely been exposed to a melange of Protestant and Catholic religious ideas and practices during the years in which her family had been enmeshed with slaveholding families. But no reference to church attendance during her years in the slave South has come down to us. One early story reported by a northern anti-slavery associate emphasizes her likely deep suspicion of the religion taught by the southern slaveholding class. Quote, when quite young, she lived with a very pious mistress but the slaveholder's religion did not pre prevent her from whipping the young girl for every slight or fancied fault. When invited into family prayers, Tubman preferred to stay on the landing and pray for herself. And I prayed to God, she says she, to make me strong and able to fight, and that's what I've always prayed for since. Tubman's religiosity, probably nourished in African-American folk religious practices, largely hidden to the slaveholders, was manifested most clearly in visionary experience and the use of prayer to invoke divine guidance and protection. 
In our first reading today, we heard from her Quaker friend Thomas Garrett describing how she evaded capture on one of her missions by carefully obeying instructions from an inner voice she identified as God. We also heard Garrett's report that her daily conversations with God were the basis for her fearlessness. Others also believed in the power she, descri she derived from this special relationship. As, as a Canadian refugee from slavery told William Wells Brown, the whites can't catch Moses because she's born with the charm. The Lord has given Moses the power. Although startled and mystified, Bradford evidently found Tubman's intense spirituality fascinating. But when revising the book in 1886, Bradford nor nervously warned her reader that Tubman's spiritual experiences, quote, seem so to enter into the realm of the supernatural that I can hardly wonder that those who never knew her are ready to throw discredit upon the story. Had I not known so well her deeply religious character and her conscientious veracity, and had I not since the war and when she was in my own house seen such remarkable instances of what seemed to be her direct intercourse with heaven, I should not dare to risk my own character for veracity by making these things public in this manner. It may have been Bradford's increasing ambivalence about reporting on, spirit, on Tubman's spiritual life and practices that caused her to make problematic revisions in one of Tubman's key stories about her spiritual life. Comparing what was published shortly after the interview sessions with the revised version, we get a fascinating look at Bradford's efforts to reshape her own and her readers' understanding of Tubman's potent and perhaps fearsome spiritual gifts. In our second reading, we heard the revised version of The Prayer for the Master's Death. In this account, while Tubman recovers from illness and severe overwork, the master callously brings potential buyers to her bedside. She responds to the insult and danger by praying for his conversion to the heartfelt Christianity that would enable him to realize the evil of his intent and give up his plan. When she hears the rumor that she and her brothers are to be sold into southern slavery, she changes her prayer and asks for the master's death. Almost immediately, she hears of his death and then appears to experience deep remorse. Just to remind you, I would give the world full of silver and gold if I had it to bring that poor soul back. I would give myself, I would give everything, but he was gone. I couldn't pray for him no more. And further, when she had recovered from her illness, a deeper religious spirit seemed to take possession of her than she had ever experienced before. And then the narrator describes a prolonged period of almost obsessive prayer, with Tubman asking to be purified of her own sins. O oh Lord, wash me, make me clean. O oh Lord, whatsoever sin there be in my heart, sweep it out, Lord, clear and clean. And at the end, she, report, she repeats, I can't pray no more for poor old master. When this version is compared to the original, as published in the 1869 book, it is striking how many small but significant changes have been made. The revision substantially magnifies the degree of remorse expressed by Tubman. And Bradford makes Tubman ask for forgiveness of her sins for Jesus' sake in the revision, though Jesus is not mentioned in the original. The reference to poor old master, as if Tubman were sentimentally attached to him, is obviously not found in the original. But most significant to my mind is the change in the order of events. In the original, the prayer for Tubman's self-purification does not occur after the killing of the master. In this position, it inevitably suggests that Tubman has plunged into the kind of deep conviction of her own unworthiness that is called the dark night of the soul in a conventional Christian conversion narrative. In stark contrast, Tubman's original story, as captured in the hasty interview, placed the prayers for self-purification before the death and in relation to the prayers to change the master's heart. Told this way, the story suggests a preparatory ritual of self-cleansing, undertaken perhaps 
to ensure the worthiness of the petitioner as a recipient of a spiritual gift of power. Then, when the change of heart does not occur after a three-month period of self-purification, Tubman is providentially alerted to the need to change her prayer. Very likely, she would have thought that God had heartened the master's heart purposefully. The model is, of course, in Exodus, where God hardened the hearts of the Egyptians before killing them, the better to display his power and solidarity with the chosen people. Once Tubman heard that the master had died unrepentant, perhaps she did have a merciful concern for him as a soul condemned to torment. In both versions, she wishes it were possible to bring his soul back, presumably in order to have an opportunity to repent his sins. But this is not the same as regret or a feeling of guilt for her prayer after his death. Bradford like many white northern Protestants influenced by the fiery rhetoric of the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, evidently believed that a just God would punish those involved in the sin of owning other human beings, but only in his own time and in his own way. But Tubman's story only makes sense if Tubman believed that she herself, through righteous prayer, had directly caused the master's death. Twenty years after first presenting the world with Tubman's frank and fierce story of the apparent gift of power that killed the master, Bradford may have balked at endorsing the idea that her heroine's prayer to, strike, uh, to God to strike the master dead was actually answered. She may have been concerned about shocking her genteel readers, both on Tubman's account and on her own. And so, if I am right, with a few subtle but important changes, in effect, Bradford censored Tubman's story of ritually preparing herself to combat and then ultimately kill the master. Despite her ambivalence about her subject's gift of, gifts of power, Bradford is still the biographer who took Tubman's spirituality most seriously. She preserved for us, however imperfectly, glimpses of the spiritual life of this complex activist woman whose impact on our debates about race, gender, and the heritage of slavery continues to be felt today. I will end here in the hope that I may have awakened your curiosity, not simply about the details of the work for social justice that the historical Tubman accomplished, but also about what she might have understood as the meaning of her work.